Hey folks, Steve here. Uh, going to be doing a review video, sort of the aftermath of a long playthrough of The Dark Sands, War in North Africa, 1940 to 1942 by Ted Racer, uh, published by GMT Games. And this is a relatively new game, 2018. Um, I think it was 2018 when it came out. It might have been early 2019 by the time it shipped. I can't remember now. Um, but uh, firstly, if you're coming to this video uh, from a review perspective, um, please know that on my YouTube channel I have done an entire full campaign playthrough, uh, turns 1 through 17, on my channel. Uh, and as I played through that, I sort of explained the game mechanics or the strategic situation and my thoughts as I went through each turn. And that can kind of give you a good idea of how the game is played, though I admittedly um, I made some rules goofs along the way. I, I imagine most folks will or do just because that's what happens when you play war games. Um, so in this video, we're going to be doing uh, a review. I'm going to go over uh, the game the game components, the mechanics. I'll touch a little bit on the way that the rules work and the gameplay works. I won't go into too much detail because, again, my playthrough video, um, I think, covers a lot of that. Uh, but um, and we'll, we'll cover enough to give you a good feel for it. Um, and then, you know, we'll just talk through my, my final thoughts on the game and... Um, what I think of it in terms of a rating, or would I recommend it. So, uh, firstly, um, just to talk about the components, I think that's a good place to start, and, and this way I can have my camera set up like I've had it set up for all the playthrough videos. Later we'll, we'll get my, my, my mug on camera here uh, to talk about everything else. But um, the box that the game comes in is sort of a standard box. It's kind of on the thinner, lower quality scale. I suspect because this is sort of a new game, it's not gotten a deluxe treatment like the Dark Valley did recently. So, you know, this is your standard uh, size box. Nothing too crazy. You know, the back gives you the normal rundown that you would expect. Um, I will say I find that the box art and the color to be really interesting. So it's sort of, you know, uh, brown, orange, red, yellow, uh, and black just comes off as like an interesting color to me. I, I think it's, it makes this game box sort of stand out um, in terms of, I don't know, just aesthetic appeal on my game shelf. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing. Not that that's something you really care about at the end of the day, but worth pointing out. Um, the game is played across two paper maps. So I use Plexi to kind of flatten that out. And you'll see, um, while I started it being really well aligned, just me bumping it and prodding it, uh, the maps kind of slid a little bit, so you kind of have to watch. There is a seam that you have to try to place the uh, maps on to get a real good look at it. Um, but uh, essentially, you know, with the length of the maps put together side by side, you're going to need a decent sized table in terms of length, which may be harder uh, for you to deal with than if this was just a normal, you know, 22 by 34 or whatever map uh, that a lot of these games are usually played on. Um, the map itself is pretty clean and aesthetically pleasing. You can kind of see uh, there are various terrain uh, identification uh, hexes on here, so you'll have like rough hexes. You'll have things that represent basically ridge lines. Um, there are desert roads, uh, trails, roads, a rail path. All of this is pretty clear to see on the map. I didn't really have any issues trying to figure out if one type of terrain was a different one or whatever. It's all pretty distinct. Uh, very clean map map work. The uh, the maps also contain copies or you know uh, or iterate. A lot of the game um, tables, not all of them, but a lot of them, which makes it a little easier to kind of, you know, if you need to look something up or you're rolling combat, um, a lot of the combat charts are right there on the map, so that's nice. And then you also have your various tracks. So there's a turn track, there's a replacement track. So here 
uh, is the turn track. And then down here are the replacement uh, tracks where you know it, it, you'll be drawing replacement chits that allow you to replace losses on the map. Um, there's places for uh, that's the dead pile, <laughs> as well as asset availability uh, boxes for your asset. Uh, counters, which we'll talk about here when we get into the game mechanics. Uh, and then there's also um, taking up sort of the top band of the maps are your reinforcement uh, boxes, which list out all of your reinforcements from turn to turn for each side um, with a picture of the counter. So what I did was, uh, you know, when I set up the game, I just got all the counters. I found their spot on the, the map, um, or not on the map, but on these tracks set them down, and then when it came time for reinforcement, I had them right there to pull off and put on the map. I suspect that's the purpose of them. But it's always good to double check, you know, what are the units that are coming in and out. Um, to talk about the counters real quick, so just grabbing a couple of examples. Um, now, I have rounded the corners of my counters, but you can kind of see, you know, these are, you know, they're decent size counters. They're, you're not going to be like squinting your eyes trying to understand they're, they're fairly large but they are the uh, you can kind of see the white core white core counter quality which is not the best and I found that I had to really truly I had to clip the counters to make sure that they're nice and pretty because th this quality the thickness of the counters leads very easy to potential bends or really rough looking flash you know the bits in the corners of the counters when you punch them uh, but I found that clipping the corners worked out really well. Now, um, would it be better if the counters were the brown core, really thick stuff that you'll, you'd will you see in the new Dark Valley reprint? Um, yeah, it'd be nicer if they were that thick. It's okay that they're not, because that ends up being a big expense, and this was a new game, so it wasn't, you know, maybe GMT didn't want to put forth that as, a, as an expense for the product. Uh, to make it more expensive because it's just a new game. And if it gets popular, maybe they'll do uh, a reprint, a deluxe treatment like they did the Dark Valley. But I'll get to that in a bit because um, there's some other things I'd like to point out for any future printings of this game. So the counters, you know, they're, they're mostly fine. You're not going to have any issues with them. I rounded the corners. That seemed to work out really well. Uh, again, could be better, but not, you know, it's perfectly acceptable in terms of counter quality. Perfectly acceptable. The uh, books that come with the game, you get a rule book and a playbook. The rule book um, comes in at 20 pages, which is very sporty, uh, very straightforward. Um, the rule book is color with um, you know all the regular detail that you would like. I would say that uh, just you know we'll get to the game mechanics, but I'd say like the 20 pages of rules. It's not very much. There are a lot of nuances to the rules that it's important that you really absorb. So I wouldn't be like, oh, it's 20 pages, you get through it and you're good to go. It's, well, there's 20 pages and there are little things that you should remember that could be easy to forget. And one thing that I would say as a critique or maybe the room for improvement in a second printing or, or deluxe edition of this game would be to include some more examples to flesh out some of the weird situations that could come up or you know what when the rule says something what does that mean show it with an example because at 20 pages you could easily explain expand the rule book to like you know maybe not 32 pages but you could certainly go up to like 24 pages and fit in a few key examples I think that would have been helpful um, so something to keep in mind for that uh, the playbook is Similarly, 20 pages, color. This is really just your scenario information. Um, and it's got, you know, scenario boxes to tell you what units go where. Um, all of these are pretty straightforward. Um, what they do have in here, and, and this is something that I'll put as a critique, there's this page on, or page 10, I guess, of a playbook, has this 2.0 and 3.0 marks for Zoc effects, zones of control, and out of supply effects summary. It is weird to have these, this page in the middle of the playbook, and it really needed to be on a player aid chart. Um, something like this, the fact that they reproduced it in the playbook as a summary of these effects, um, 
just screams this should have been on a player aid card, and it, and it, it was not. Um, it's got an extended example of play. The ex extended example of play is pretty good. It's got some designer notes, and I love designer notes. Gosh, I, you know, I could just read books of designer notes. Uh, so that was pretty, that was good. Um, so for the most part, good. Um, but I think it is showing that there are some improvements that could be made just in arranging the information that the game gives to you. Um, you get some player raid charts, so uh, you get sort of a, a typical one, I'll say. It's got sequence of play. It's got the terrain effects chart produced here, which is also on the map. Uh, and then you have sort of the combat charts. So you have an assault CRT, a mobile CRT, a listing of the DRMs, die roll modifiers and whatnot. Then a couple of things for uh, disruption mechanics, rail advancement mechanics, which is pretty straightforward stuff, listings about what the combat results are. So this is actually pretty good, except there's one major weakness to this player aid chart that isn't a big deal, but it can cause a problem for players. And I this is a recommendation, again, for a second edition printing. Please, GMT, move this chart to the top and this chart to you know the middle or whatever because when I look at this chart the chart that you use for most of the game is the mobile CRT which happens to be in the middle of the page now you know maybe some folks when they pick up a player aid chart they want to look at something boom it's right there in the middle that might work but I'm drawn to the top because I you know I've read English is you know top to bottom left to right boom I'm looking at the assault CRT but this assault CRT is only used on certain turns and is only used by the allies. And so my mistake I had made in my playthrough was that it wasn't all the time because I, I tried to remind myself mobile CRT, mobile CRT, but in my rush to getting through the game and just figuring out what to do, I sometimes use the assault CRT by mistake. And there is a difference. The, the assault CRT produces more step losses and the mobile CRT produces more retreats. So it, it's something you really got to watch out for. And what I, what I ended up doing was I sort of, you know, it's over to the left here, but I'll just show it as an example. I like tucked this underneath the map so where it was only showing the mobile CRT so I would stop making that mistake. Um, so, you know, it, I, I could see people arguing it the other way around that this works fine, but. I don't know. If, if you've got a comment on it, or if you've played the game and you're just watching this video for fun, um, and you have an opinion on it, put it in the comments or something, just so we can see if I'm not the only one who's feeling that way. Um, and then you also have a cha uh, player aid chart that tells you the action chit availability. That just tells you what action chits are available each turn. The way that works is, is on this schedule, um, different activation chits or action chits are in the randomizer cup that you'll pull from to, to govern what happens and who takes what action. And each turn is a little bit different, so you may have turns where your options are limited, you may have turns where your options are really wide open, you just have a different set, and all of this, the logic behind it, is sort of um, tied up in some of the history, uh, things that were happening outside of this front that influenced this front, like pulling units and commanders off to other fronts because this was sort of a, you know, it wasn't a premier front of the war of, the war of World War II. So, um, so there's some of that. I, I had talked in my gameplay uh, series, some of my frustrations with it, just that feeling of, well, if you get a crappy turn where this schedule gives you a crappy set of chits, there's not much you can really do about it, but probably what you can try to do is plan ahead knowing, hey, next turn's probably not going to be a great turn, I really need to try to set myself up as best as I can this turn. So there's that. And, you know, folks are going to feel differently about it. I know that's been some folks's, other folks' concern on, like, Board Game Geek talking about the action shit schedule. And, and the Dark Valley has it as well, but it is implemented slightly differently there. So I don't know. Ultimately, I you know, it, it wasn't a huge deal. It wasn't a deal breaker. It wasn't a bad thing. It was just something I was trying to be conscious of as I played. Um, to try to figure out, well, did this schedule really control the game too much? And I, and I can't... I think right now I would say it doesn't totally railroad the game, but it does sometimes put you under constraints that, are, that can feel uncomfortable. And I think that was Ted 
uh, Ted's intention. So, it, so you know, I, I guess that just is going to depend on how that hits you. Now, there's one thing I have to say is is sort of a problem. So this is going to be another thing for second printing. Uh, I created for myself my own little two-column printout sheet that has those Zoc effects, the out-of-supply effects. I also put in here the forts, uh, the Allied Assault Doctrine, which is something special in the rules, uh, the Panzer Doctrine, another thing special in the rules, German infiltration, disruption effects, da da da, da. I picked, basically, certain paragraphs out of the rule book that, to me, seem like things that could be easily forgotten, and I put them on my own chart, in you know, my own little printout, um, just copy and paste the text and try to format it, uh, and, I, and I printed my own. So that worked. It worked fine, and it was helpful that I had that. And if you're interested in using that uh, same file as I did, I put it up in the file section of Board Game Geek, and I can put a link down in the description below uh, for that. Um, but for a second printing of the game, it really felt like that information should have been on a player aid chart. And I know that the new Dark Valley uh, printing got, you know, thumbs ups from people about having good player aid charts. I think the Dark Sands really needs another player aid chart that includes a lot of that information that I put on mine. Um, you know, not a big deal, but this seems like a no-brainer of the type of information that should be on a chart. And if this game gets that deluxe treatment in the future, I think that that's an obvious improvement that could be made that would... would be great. Again, not not bad that it's not there now, but it definitely seems like an area of improvement that would that would be great. Um, okay, so a couple of other things, uh, just in terms of component critiques, and and I don't want to do it too much because at the end of the day, what really matters is just the gameplay. But um, let me see if I can find a good example. Um, okay, so. The way that the game does reinforcements is that during the course of the game you start with some units and then each turn when you draw from that randomizer cup and you have a reinforcement chit come out for your faction, you're usually able to place new units on the map and there are placement rules for that. Nothing terribly complicated, but for the allies, something that can happen is that you can have units withdrawn. Sometimes you have units that are exchanged and sometimes you have units that are upgraded. Now, most of all of that is very straightforward and it makes sense. The upgrades are very easy, though I did forget to do some at first in my playthrough, though I corrected it, and that's really more on me than anything. I should have been paying closer attention. Um, I think some of the artillery markers that are in the game probably need to... Somehow that information needs to be conveyed better than just on the counter. Um because I misread how the, the, the you get some of these artillery chits and then you get um, replacements. So here, see like, okay, here's the first one you get. It's an Italian artillery. On turn 12, this is a withdrawn, and you get this one. See, it's, and that says 12 in a white box. So on turn 12, this unit will come in, this unit, or this, you know, chit, will be replaced by this one. And if you look at that, sort of the symbols chosen there, the, the boxes and the numbers and everything, that's mostly straightforward. But I was so, you know, focused on using this upper track that for some reason these counters aren't, aren't treated the same way as the actual combat units in terms of upgrades where... Um, well, I mean, I... I, I guess they are, but they're not called out as upgrades, and that's, I guess, my problem with it. Um, so there are some, just to kind of show you on the turn track. So it says turn eight upgrades. So very clearly, everything in that box is an upgrade. It has a box to its left that just says turn eight. So that's stuff that's either coming in or being withdrawn if it's in a red box. But then you have the, the upgrades, which is to say those units are going to replace existing units on the map. But the problem is, like those Italian artillery, they were not shown that way on the map at all. Um, or not on the map, but on these tracks. And so I had accidentally used 
some of the artillery markers as if they were additional artillery markers, not upgrade, because I wasn't paying close enough attention to those boxes in the upper right. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so again, you could say, well, Steve, you need to pay more attention, but I made a bad assumption because the game treated all these other things one way and then for some reason didn't treat the others the same way. I think that that's something that is easily fixable. Again, hey, second edition, second printing, whatever, I think that's a no-brainer. Wouldn't, wouldn't take much to do, and in fact, there's even some extra space over here. Uh, you can see that sort of this brown blank space next to turn 14. You've got some room to work with, so you could slide some stuff around, fit, fit in a new box, and, and deal with it that way. Um, now, when it comes to the withdrawals, right, so we're like, here are some units that are withdrawn from the game, and when they're gone, they never come back. So there's some Australian brigades. Um, now, again, the, the track at the top is pretty good at telling you when they withdraw, and once they've done that, um, basically, uh, are there units that are going to come replace them or not? So when you exchange a withdrawn unit for a new unit, that's easy. And you can even put the new unit where the old unit was. That's great. In some cases, units are withdrawn with no replacement. And what I found to be sort of a, a tough thing is when you're dealing with all these stacks of units, sometimes multiple units in a hex, and you're trying to move those units around, you go, oh, I've got to withdraw this unit. Where the heck is it? Oh, I found it. Oh, no. If I withdraw this unit, that's going to be very bad because it's going to, you know, open up a hole in the line or whatever the issue is. And again, you could say, well, just look at that turn track harder and figure out what are all the withdrawing units and just keep note of that. Okay, yeah, you could do that. But I think what would be really useful and would help is if these units had... Um, maybe, much like the other uh, symbols that have been used, maybe you just put a red dot, or you put a red square or something that says, hey, on this turn it's withdrawn. Um, the bummer, or the reason why that wouldn't work super easily, is that there are cases where units are withdrawn, they come back, and they're withdrawn again. Um, so maybe all you would need to do is mark that for the units that are withdrawing and don't have an exchange replacement. Um, or something like that, right? It just, you know, these are things I'm kind of brainstorming, but point to say, like, there are these little logistical challenges with the components. They're not insurmountable. They're really not even that bad. But I wanted to call them out here because I, I it's like spoilers for what I think of the game. I think the game probably should get a second printing someday or a deluxe treatment and some of these improvements, I think, would really polish up the game from where it's at now. I mean, it's perfectly playable now. Um, these little improvements could really, I think, polish it up nice and shiny. Um, okay, so uh, let's get past the components and let's just talk strictly gameplay. So this is a hex encounter game, which in theory is really straightforward and nothing too fancy, right? You have hexes, you're going to have... Uh, multiple units looking to attack a single defending hex. Uh, you're going to be looking at odds ratios with combat factors. All of that stuff is very straightforward. So straightforward, in fact, you, you're, you're probably looking at these counters. You've probably got a good idea of what they all mean, right? You have an attack factor, a defense factor, and a movement factor. That's pretty normal, you know, um, normal counter setups for these units, right? Pretty straightforward. Units have a reduced side, so they take a step loss, you flip them. They have this bar that shows them as reduced, typically with fewer uh, attack or defense factors. Not terribly complicated, right? But the game does have some challenge that you need to make sure you read the rules for in terms of the nuances. And that's something that, as I played through the game, um, in my playthrough, I discovered these nuances and... You know, I think the next time I play this game will we'll go much more smoothly and I'll have a greater appreciation for what the game is doing. Where the first one was like, oh man, I just, I, I, eureka moment, here's this thing. Um, 
and I think the reality is that uh, the two sides, the Axis and the Allies, are actually pretty asymmetrical, which is something you don't typically get in Hex Encounter games. It's always, you know, well, I mean, I guess you do sometimes. It's just the way that the, it's portrayed. And here, being an operational game, uh, they're managing to fit in some nuances of the organi organizational structures of the two sides and how they manifest themselves. So, for instance, this game has stacking like most other Hex Encounter games, uh, and you can usually fit, it's like most, most of the time, three units in a hex. And when you deal with that and you go into combat, there's something called combat stacking. So when you're on the center map, and there's really three logical maps here, right? There's a west map, there's the center map here, and then there's an east map. The east and the west maps are at a slightly different scale. They're about twice as big. Each hex is covering about twice as much length of area as a hex on the center map. And so what happens is when you're on the west or the east maps and you've got your three or sometimes four units in a hex, all units can participate in combat because there's a lot more area that you're working in. When you're on the center map, which is where most of the action is probably going to take place in the game, you can only defend with two brigades um, or battalions or you know anything higher than that. Uh, you can only attack with that many in a, from a hex and defend with that many in a hex. And one of the interesting things about the game, this is going to be one of those things like you you got to pay attention to the counters. Um, the, the Axis actually has some units that would be um, in the... But okay, battalion. All right. So so, <laughs> the game has divisions. It has brigades. It has regiments, and it has battalions. And there is a you know in the rulebook a nice little guy that tells you the NATO symbols for all of that. Uh, for the most part, you're only going to be able to attack with two brigades or two regiments in a hex. Um, but with battalions, uh, battalions are kind of ignored for combat stacking, so they can get in there and support attacks with the two other units. And where the asymmetry of the game kind of comes into play is that the allies pretty much universally are operating only with brigades. So when on the center map, while they can have three units in a hex, or sometimes four, uh, but for them it's pretty much just going to be three, they're only going to be able to attack or defend with two of them at a time. Whereas the Axis actually is working with a lot of different types of units. So just to kind of show, um, if I grab, let's see, we've got, what, two battalions and a regiment here that I'm going to show on screen in just a second? Yeah, two regiments and a battalion. So we've got two infantry uh, battalions and, or I'm sorry, regiments, two regiments and a tank battalion. Well, for combat stacking, whoops, we would ordinarily just have these two units, so attacking with eight combat factors. But this guy gets to join too, because he's only just a little tiny uh, battalion, but that battalion has eight combat factors, which is better than these infantry. And so the, the Axis will tend to have this ability to get more forces involved in a combat than maybe the allies could, and thus typically are able to generate better odds ratios. And due to uh, special mechanics related to panzers, uh, German tank units, the actual panzers, uh, can even get additional bonuses to combat for die roll modifiers, and in some cases doubling their combat factors against infantry-only stacks. So there's a whole thing here uh, around you know, how the allies are operating and how the Axis is operating. Um, so that's sort of just like a, a broad highlight of some of the mechanics, but just to kind of speak to the way the game kind of flows, is you typically have a replacement phase where you will draw one of many of these replacement chits, and that will tell you how many steps of a given type you can replenish for units that are on the map, or if they were eliminated, you can rebuild them. Um, but typically it takes some time for them to get to the front lines of combat once you do that. 
So it might say you get a tank replacement or an infantry replacement, or for the Axis, uh, that sort of bottom uh, on their gray counter there is for Italian units. Um, the other ones, the tank and the helmet, are for Germans only. The Allies just are working with uh, you know, tank and infantry replacements. So you'll get that, you'll replace and replenish your losses with that, and then uh, what you'll do is you'll have the initiative uh, determination, which is usually either governed by the turn track, um, or depending on if, the, if one player got to go twice in a row at the end of a turn, the next turn uh, the other player will get initiative. And the strength of initiative is they actually get to play, the, the, the initiative side gets to pick which action shit will be played first out of what's all the possible stuff that's going to go in the randomizer cup. So if it's really important to do a move action, you'll do a move action um, first, and then everything else that could be possible will go into that cup. Now, um, I've got some of those action shits from the last turn of the game I played, and it, this is a good sort of sampling of what are the different options that you have for those action shits. So, um, some of the time, you will have movement chits, and you will sometimes have combat chits. So when you draw a movement, that means all of your units can move up to their movement allowance. If you draw a combat, that means all of your units can conduct combat. Um, you'll sometimes get variations of that, so you see there's a combat minus one chit there in gray. That means you conduct, conduct combats with all of your units, but they suffer a minus one DRM, and sometimes you are only able to do half moves. It'll say that you can only take a half move. Basically, each unit can only use half of its movement allowance. Sometimes uh, you'll have specialty counters like the Panzer... Let's see if I can get it to focus. Panzer Army Africa. Uh, come on. Yeah, my camera's having a hard time with that. Panzer Army Africa. So, so some of these counters uh, will be meant to activate uh, HQ units on the map. And we've got a few on the map I could show you right now. And how this will typically work is it'll say, okay, well, that chip will activate this HQ. And these HQs have a little range in the upper right there. That one says three. So units that are within three hexes of that HQ can move and attack. So those are sort of specialty chits. So sometimes you'll get, like, you'll draw, it'll say move. You can move your units. But they can't attack. It's not, you know, like some hex encounter games where you move and attack and that's it. It's, well, they just move. And then it could be that the next chit out of the cup is the enemy's move. So if you moved up to engage the enemy, they have an opportunity, basically, to retreat if they want to, or counter move, or whatever, before you can take an action. And it's these specialty chits that allow you to activate within the range of an HQ that will sometimes allow you to move and then attack, which is that normal thing that we're used to in Hex and Counter War games, um, or usually used to, or that that's, seems to be the norm, um, which is very powerful in this game, as opposed to the, well, you might draw a combat chit, but if none of your units are next to the enemy, it's a wasted chit, and that sort of gets into the chaos of the of the randomizer cup. And again, the chit availability each turn. Um, am I going to get a lot of move chits this turn? Am I going to get the combat chits that I need? Will I get any of these specialty chits that will allow me to do uh, more stuff? And what ends up being a real challenge is making sure that the units that you want to be using are actually within range of the HQ. And so that is something that I... <laughs> I grew to appreciate as I played the game where I sometimes maybe forgot to move the HQ unit. Now all of a sudden I've got a bunch of units out of range, I can't activate them. Or maybe the, the action chip for the HQ specifies that that HQ is going to activate non-tank units or it's going to activate mostly tank units. And if you didn't put that HQ near your tank units, again, wasted opportunity. So I think there is a huge amount of, I guess, situational awareness you need when playing this game to, to really have a good grasp of the operational actions you're taking and are the right units where they need to be. Um, 
something that can sometimes be a, a chore to remember or to recognize in the game is that some units, and uh, let me see if I can find a good example of this. Here we go. Some units are part of the same division. So these two regiments, if you look at the sort of, the, there's a cadence to knowing the organizational structure of units, but over here on the left, top left, that top number after this slash is 164th. So one, the 164th, uh, I suppose that's the division. Um, so these units are, in theory, supposed to be uh, working together as part of a uh, organizational structure of a division. And the game does have some benefits and penalties to operating in that way. So if you have units that are part of the same division that are really spread out, that's usually a bad thing. You do want to keep all units of the same division together, especially as the allies, because they have a thing called an uh, uh, allied assault doctrine. So in the last so many turns of the game, they get to use the more bloody combat table. But there are restrictions on getting to use that, and one of the restrictions is you need to be attacking with units excuse me, that are part of the same division. And again, if you've misplaced units or you've done a reaction move to what the enemy is doing uh, and you didn't realize that you were separating units that were part of the same um, uh, part of the same division, then you might find yourself in a tough spot. So there's a lot to just be aware of because the core of the gameplay in this game really is that operational movement, the positioning of forces to cut supply lines, and uh, just, again, maintaining that um, operational command structure uh, to the right level. Now, um, when you're doing all of this, the movements and the combats, terrain will tend to be pretty important. Uh, you can have some cases like here, and you can kind of see the difference in color, hopefully, on your screen. Like, this is an escarpment, this is a ridge, and this is a wadi. And each has a slightly different effect on movement, zones of control, and uh, combat. And so, you know, effectively you'll have these, rid these escarpment lines that create a barrier. Um, and just to kind of show, I'm going to move some units out of the way. Again, this is all the aftermath of me moving chits around after the game is over. Um, this escarpment line, in effect divides this area of the map. So you could have units that are coming north of that line, you have units that are coming south of that line, and there's really only a few paths through it. Um, over here, there are ridges, which you can more or less pass over with some cost to movement, but once you get to here, you can't cross over these hex sides until you get to the Halfaya Pass. Um, which is a ridge line and has a trail running through it. And over here, there are trails running here. So if you were looking to take the uh, objective hex right there, the terrain is going to create some interesting situations where you're going to be limited in projecting force north of this ridge line, and it's really important that you get units around the ridge line, take the pass, so that you can then potentially come back out around and attack from the west to take that objective hex, so both from the southeast and from the west. Um, and so there are certainly bottlenecks that are on the map due to these terrain features. There's also um, certain lines of wadis, like over here, there's a little bit of a glare, but you can kind of see this line that runs along here. That's actually, you know, better, decent um, defensive terrain uh, because of that, and that might be a good area to set up a defensive line on one side or the other of the of the wadis. <coughs> the other thing that really plays into the the fact that this is a North Africa campaign uh, game is that you do have a lot of wide open space of desert to work with, and that's where your high movement allowance units like mobilized infantry and tanks are going to be shining to cut up and around the enemy to cut off their supply lines. Now, uh, the way supply works in this game is pretty straightforward. 
um, in that each side basically has supply sources and to get supply back on the center map units have to trace uh, at most eight hexes free of enemy units and enemy zocks uncontested zocks meaning you know you can have a buddy and a hex you're using to trace supply uh, in an enemy zock but if that if you don't have a buddy there and it's the enemy zock then you can't trace your supply line through it you can get again count that you know one to eight hexes back to a trail which you can just barely probably see on the map I can zoom in a little bit a trail an active railroad uh, or a road if you can trace back to there and then that road line uh, is free of enemy units so like up here uh, you'll be able to trace supply it's sort of weird it's one way to think of it is like if they can get back to a major uh, travel route and there are no enemies on that travel route they can trace supply so how you cut supply would be trying to come out around units and sit on those uh, main travel routes like the trail and now these units can't uh, trace supply unless they can count around the unit to that trail up to eight hexes so even if this unit this uh, German tank was sitting on the desert trail uh, this unit could count, you know, one, two, or, you know, ex avoiding the Zox, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, six hexes is less than eight, um, less than or equal to eight, and now they trace from the desert road all the way to the ends of the map where they draw supply from. So, uh, it, it makes sense when you see it in play. I might not be explaining it a great way, but just that, um, it can open up some interesting situations where when you're over here on the west side of the map you have this sort of main desert road that goes from Tobruk blah 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 down all the way over to Alexandria on the east map that's a pretty important desert road for supply and keeping folks sort of uh, in good order because that you can do extended moves so as long as you're not doing anything else or getting close to the enemy you can sort of do what would be the equivalent of equivalent of a strategic move to along the, like the major road uh, to get to where you want to be but even movement on that that road costs less per hex than a trail so if you're trying to to move moving from desert to desert hex is more expensive than moving along the trail which is more expensive than moving along the road um, so that road's important the whole way through, but you still have to worry about these desert trails because even if you had snaked up around here, around like these units, and stuck a, an allied unit up here on that desert road, you say, oh, I cut all your guys out of supply. Well, no, because they could still trace on these desert trails all the way west and then all the way west again off to their final supply source and so it's not just about taking the main roads you're also going to be fighting to take the critical trail junctions and towns that are a little bit more out uh, in the desert and I think this is all you know tied up in how the North Africa campaign was conducted and so I think it, it matches exactly what it needs to be doing um, to have a supply system that makes sense for the battles but isn't terribly complicated and yeah, sometimes you got to double check the count of the hexes, and sometimes moving one unit in just the right place can really change a supply situation, and that's sort of the point of the game, I guess, in a lot of ways. And and really, it's the best way to eliminate units is to cut them out of supply, because what will happen is you will draw logistics chits. There are two in the cup every turn, and uh, gosh, I'm not going to be able to focus, am I? Yeah, a logistics chit, that blue chit with the truck on it. When that's drawn, you check supply for every unit. So if you don't think those chits are going to come up, you can be pretty risky and put your units um, in a place where they could be out of supply if you checked it. But it's only when you draw the log logistics chit do you actually check supply. And if you can't trace those supply lines, they get an out-of-supply marker, which basically 
makes them very susceptible to combat and are weaker. They're not totally useless, but they are much weaker and are going to have a hard time uh, functioning. And if you get to the end of the turn, you there is an attrition segment where you basically check to see, well, are those out-of-supply units still out-of-supply? Um, and if they are, they're completely eliminated. So it's quite possible that you could eliminate, you know, uh, eight steps worth of units without taking a single loss because you cut their supply lines at the right time. Whereas trying to take out eight steps of units via combat is likely going to have a lot of risk and a lot of losses for your own units. So that ability to maneuver and snake around and cut supply lines and, and circle guys, that's really going to be a great method of, of playing the game um, and, and succeeding in the goals that you need to succeed on. Uh, I don't want to get too much more into the mechanics other than to say that there are availability or asset availability uh, mechanics here. So what you'll usually have, I'll flip some of these back, is I'll throw a few of these all together so I can zoom in on them a little bit. So you'll often have uh, these different asset chits that you use in combat. So the one on the left is a naval asset for the allies. That means they can add two combat factors to a combat that is on the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, that center one is an air force unit. So basically they can just throw in a combat factor in whatever combat. And then that artillery one on the far right can add three combat factors as long as the combat is within range of the right HQ. And that shit actually says 30 on it, so you need to use the 30th uh, core HQ. That's, you know, the combat needs to be within range of the HQ to do that. Um, the Axis have their own as well. They have a bunch of assets. And, you know, these mechanics are used elsewhere, um, but basically you're going to have uh, the gameplay where, okay, there's a combat, the attacker is going to decide, are they going to throw in any assets, and then the defender responds. Now, when you're playing solo like I did, it can kind of be difficult to, I guess, really surprise yourself, obviously. Um, and what ends up happening is the attacker has to decide, you know, am I going to spend enough of my assets that it will make the expenditure of my opponent's assets irrelevant, meaning I've thrown so many combat factors in that even if the defender threw in all the assets that they could, will it make a difference for the uh, combat odd shift? Um, but likewise, it's sort of like, well, as I, the defender, if the attacker throws in all their assets, I can hold mine back and say, okay, fine, let them have a really powerful attack, but now they used up a lot of their assets, and I can use mine. And so it's just that sort of like bidding, trying to figure out like where do you want to spend these things, and where does it make the most sense to. When I played solo, I just tried to figure out what was the mathematically best thing to do as the attacker. Um, I think when you're playing a real opponent, um, it'll be more interesting because you're you're gonna you know, maybe bluff like oh I I tricked the Axis player into deploying their anti-tank guns over here, and there are anti-tank gun assets that are pretty powerful. You know, I've forced him to use it over here, but now he doesn't have any left, and this is where my real, you know, armor tank attack was going to be. I think you could do that in a face-to-face -face game, but against myself, I simply could not do it, and so the assets ended up being probably not as interesting as they could be in a real game against someone. So, um... I, I like that it's in the game. It allows some variety and some extra sort of thinking and strategy to where your attacks are going to be. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Again, it's mostly just adding combat factors, and that really just becomes important if you're going to be like, oh, I only need one or two more combat factors to get 3-to-1 odds versus 2-to-1 odds, so I'm going to put in these assets, but now the defender puts in some assets, and now it's back down to 2-to-1 instead of 3-to-1. Like, it's, it's that kind of thinking that you're working through. Um, in terms of the actual way that you win the game, so you know, I think I've described the, the basic rhythm of the game and how it works. Again, moving, combat, there are assets, terrain's a factor, all that good stuff. How do you win the game? Well, you accrue victory points, but how you accrue victory points 
is mostly area control based and their each side kind of has a different way to go so for the axis they can accrue victory points and I'm sorry for the glare but we're just gonna have to deal with that a little bit um, the axis can score victory points during the regular turns if they control to Brook which is an important hex in the game in general uh, and either Mersimetra or El Alamein. And if they control all three, then they can get even more victory points on a recurring basis. So every turn that they can hold those positions, they'll get victory points. Similarly, the allies will get, you know, a victory point every turn if they control Benghazi, all the way over here. It is difficult, or at least it was difficult in my game, to get that far with the forces that I had. I just, I was playing kind of cautiously. I didn't make that leap. But what's really important is if you can grab those special hexes and hold them and accrue those victory points, that can be a big deal. In my game, neither the Axis or the Allies were able to get those turn victory points. The Allies never got to Benghazi. The Axis never got to Mersimatra. Again, I was playing very cautiously. I think it is probably likely that you could do that if you're playing someone. Um, but at the end of the game, you then determine the sort of last turn victory points, and you basically get a victory point for Tobruk, Bardia, and Solemn here. And at the end of my game, the Axis had managed to hold on to all three of those hexes and won the game with three victory points to zero. But that was just my game. In your games, you could find that each side is pushed all the way to the left side of the map, the west side of the map, then the Axis pushed all the way to the east, and you could be in this tug of war of accruing victory points I suspect that's how most games will probably go, but again, playing solo, I ended up just playing very conservatively. So that's how you win the game. Um, there are some other things around building the Tobruk Bypass Road and extending the railroad. I won't get into that. It, it, it's part of the game, but not too crazy. Um, I think I covered the vast majority of what the game is like at this point, uh, and I think we can just shift it now to my thoughts uh, on the game itself and hopes for the future. Okay, so, um, in terms of what I thought of the game, um, this is, again, based on my one solo playthrough, so it could be that my opinion changes over time. Maybe if I play this again or I play it opposed, I could end up having a, a change in opinion. If I do, I'll create some sort of addendum video or, or something to address it, but Based on right now, I'd say this is a pretty pretty good game. Um, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was hard for me to play it because I recorded my playthrough series over the course of like almost two months. So it was hard for me to just get away from the house and, and play and record and, and work my way through it. Um, it has a, a good flow that I think when you're really rolling and you know the rules well enough to really be playing it. It doesn't take long to get through a turn. It took me a while to get through my turns because I'm explaining the game mechanics as I went through my video series, but um, it feels like you could probably ratchet through the turns pretty quickly, um, probably less than an hour a turn easily, and so um, you can play the full campaign and probably like two long sittings with a buddy, or if you're both really fast, maybe one long sitting with a buddy. Um, or, and I didn't address this earlier in the video, the, the game does have uh, different starting points. So you can play shorter scenarios. You can play just um, like Crusader, for instance, or Sunflower, these operations that were within this theater of operations. You can play shorter scenarios that are only a few turns long, or you can use one of those um, scenarios as a starting point to then play through the rest of the turns through turn, turn 17, which is the last turn. So if you can't play the full campaign, there are um, shorter campaigns you can work through or you can kind of figure out like what works best for you, and that can help too. So if you don't have the time to play the whole thing, you can only have these two big maps set up uh, for so long, I think that's a great option. Um, so from that level, I think this game really works well for someone maybe who isn't used to playing Hex Encounter games or is looking to get into them, it's not super overly complicated. It's not like you're staring at 
honestly, The Dark Valley, which is the other game in, in the dark system by Ted Racer. It's a much bigger game, probably more intimidating, um, a lot more going on. Here, the counters are bigger, the hexes are bigger. Uh, it's very visceral in terms of moving the units around and creating uh, uh, you know, supply problems and all of that. I think that would work very well for someone who's just stepping into Hex Encounter, for sure. But there's still enough of the mechanics and, again, the operational concerns that someone who really likes Hex Encounter games already um, can probably latch onto this and enjoy it as you know a modern, pretty straightforward um, game on the North Africa campaign. Now, uh, like I said earlier in the video, I do think that this game probably deserves a, a second printing or a deluxe treatment where some of the logistical component stuff could be enhanced and polished. And if they did that, this game would be even better. Um, it would be a little easier just to get folks playing it. As is, it's still, again, a very good game. Um, I think if you have an interest in the North Africa campaign, um, you would have a, a great time with this one. If you, again, are, are just getting used to Hex Encounter games, um, I think this is a pretty good place to start, though, again, cautioning that there are nuances to the rules that are worth keeping in mind. So, again, like the divisional stuff I talked about, um, combat stacking rules, there are these little nuances that are, would be very easy to miss if you're new to Hex Encounter. Um, now, I have issues overall with operational games, period, just because I like strategy games, strategic level games, where I can decide where my reinforcements are going and how much I'm sending and all of that. As an operational game, you have constraints. You have constraints around you know, what you're going to get, and that assumption is all based on the historical situation. And so if the game that you're playing is going ahistorical, those assumptions about reinforcements and replacements and all of that will not react to you like they would maybe in real life or in a strategic level game. So if you're not used to operational level stuff, that's just a word of warning that you will have some things that may be a bummer to, to be thinking about, like, you know, the allies are getting their butts kicked, why would you withdraw a bunch of these units? Or these units are holding a very critical spot like Tobruk, why would they be withdrawn right now? Couldn't they, couldn't you, wouldn't Allied Command withdraw some other unit, right? That kind of stuff won't happen, and so you have to kind of play within the system. Um, if you're used to that and, and you're fine with that for operational games, then, you know, that, that's probably just what you're used to already. For me, that's one thing I had to kind of get over. Um, but again, I, I had a good time with it. Um, I definitely think this is a game I could, I could introduce to some of my friends who are still getting used to war games, and we could probably have a good time with it. So... Um, in terms of a rating, I'd, I'd probably say, uh, I will say 8 out of 10. You know, definitely um, solid. If the Deluxe Edition were to ever come out with some of the component improvements, I think that could bump it up to an 8.5 or a 9. Um, you know, it's definitely a good, solid game. Um, you know, there's nothing that sticks out as a glaring issue with it. It does what it needs to do. Um, for what it's trying to portray. Uh, there are a lot of tough decisions to make. You're trying to find the right combat. You're trying to find the right position. Um, you're dealing with the chaos of the chits and making the best of, of your war plan. So I think it just comes together pretty, pretty well. Um, yeah, so again, uh, the Dark Sands, 1940 to 1942, were in North Africa by GMT Games. Uh, check it out. It's still pretty new, so it should be in stock. Uh, if, and if it's not, I guess, you know, find it on the secondary market, and we'll keep our fingers crossed for a someday reprint, right? Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you'd like to watch my entire playthrough, uh, that is available on my YouTube channel. I have a playlist for the Dark System, Dark Series. Uh, right now, it's only Dark Sands-related videos. Eventually, I will get to the Dark Valley. I have it off-screen here on one of my tables, staring at me. Uh, much bigger game, much more intimidating. I will eventually get to that on this channel as well. Um, if you like this video, hit like. If you'd like to see more content like this, hit subscribe. 
And until next time, take care.